Good afternoon. My name is Ellen Forsyth. I work at the State Library of New South Wales, which is built on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which each of the libraries we are, we are in stand. We pay respects to Aboriginal elders past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to other First Nations people. We celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal cultures and languages across Australia. As well, we acknowledge the contribution that people of many nations have made to this country. Please take a moment in chat to let us know your name, the library you're from, the state, as well as the traditional owners of the land your library is on. Today is a collaboration and I would like to acknowledge the work of people in various states and territories that led to this session taking place. If you're sharing on social media, please use hashtag wider local studies and I will put that up in chat. Uh, any questions you have for Bill, please put in chat and I'd ask that everyone uh, remains muted while Bill is presenting. There will be the plenty of opportunity to ask questions later, but please put them in chat so they're kind of in the queue. That would be terrific. Uh, I'm really excited to be um, introducing Bill Wilkie, who's a librarian and is author of The Daintree Blockade, The Battle for Australia's Tropical Rainforest. Bill is based in Mossman. You can really see the contrast um, from his location to some of the rest of us today. And he works part-time with Douglas Libraries in far North Queensland and has been working there since 2006. His research received the Queensland Premier's Award in 2017 for work of state significance. Please join me in welcoming Bill. Thank you. So as Ellen said, uh, my name is Bill Wilkie and I've written a book um, called The Dame Tree Blockade. I'll just uh, quickly flick to a, a screen or a slide that shows what I think will, or what I plan to talk about um, today. And as Ellen said, there'll be uh, hopefully time at the end for some questions, which I'm happy to take. Um, so yeah, my name is Bill Wilkie. I'm an author and a librarian living in Mossman in far north Queensland. I um, often describe myself as a writer and a storyteller because when people um, say I'm an author, people um, look at my, uh, my uh, grammar and, and, and wonder how I could possibly be an author. So I kind of put storyteller in there so, to kind of let them know, well, I'm not really a you know, my grammar's so terrible, I don't know where to put the commas and apostrophes and all of that. But I, so I think of myself as a storyteller, I guess, more than anything. And I think that's important in the, in the way that I um, approach my research and have approached this topic in particular. Um, and that will come up um, throughout the course of the session, I think. Um, we'll have a little look at the Daintree Coast. I'll introduce you to the Daintree Blockade, which is the event that I researched and have written the book about. We'll have a look at the Douglas Library's local history collection, which is where my journey uh, for this project commenced. I will talk about a few of my eureka moments in research because I think they really point to how local his how local uh, studies collections, um, the importance of them, how they're gathered, how they're curated, and how they are shared. Uh, I will also discuss this idea of my perspective of being a writer and how that influences my, um, my approach to the research and finish off with some a bit of a discussion about how I see the importance of local studies in the future, some of the current concerns and particularly as it relates to um, it being um, my research being of uh, environmental in nature or, or um, looking at environmental issues, which can sometimes be controversial, particularly when they relate to local uh, planning issues and uh, being um, land use. Um, so this is the Daintree Coast and the, um, the green little um, knob there is Cape Tribulation. This is where the action for the Daintree uh, blockade took place. As you can see, there's hardly any development along that coast. There's just a few buildings there and that road that stretches north from Cape Tribulation up into the distance to Bloomfield is where the action for the Daintree blockade took place. Um, it is home to our many endemic 
um, and rare and threatened species, tree kangaroo, cassowaries, um, has been linked to the birthplace of flowering plants, um, of all flowering plants um, from the time, from Gondwana time, so very ancient um, rainforest and very rare, um, not just in Australia, but, but globally. Um, that's the coast, quite picturesque. It's now a, a tourist um, destination and you can still be walking on one of these beaches in the height of um, the tourist season and only find one or two other people on the beach. So it's a, quite a remarkable place um, to visit and an even more remarkable place to um, live in. Daintree blockade, rather than rewrite things, I might just read the blurb from the book so you get a, a general perspective of what the blockade was about. So this is the, the back cover of my book. On the 30th of, no of November, 1983, the Douglas Shire Council commenced work on a road from Cape Tribulation to Bloomfield in far North Queensland. The road was set to go through the recently declared Cape Tribulation National Park and some of the last remaining lowland tropical rainforest in the country. A small group of local residents organised a protest to stop work on the road. The media arrived, the police were called in, and when supporters of the protest arrived from southern states, the confrontation escalated into a full-blown environmental protest, the Dame Tree Blockade. Blockade set off a clash of ideologies, greenies against developers, hippies against the local council and anarchists against police. In time, the Daintree blockade would take its place as one of the big three of Australia's early environment, early rainforest campaigns, along with Terrania Creek and the Franklin River that helped shape the growing Australian environment movement. Uh, Bill Wilkie, that's me, takes readers into the heart of the Daintree, the oldest rainforest on the planet revealing the courage, passion, and dedication of those who fought to protect it. That's the basic um, outline of the book and what the protest was about. So we've got that, uh, that slide that, it, that we were just on of the Daintree Coast. So um, Douglas Shire Council in 1983 decided to build a road um, north along that coast. There was no road there and it was the only um, stretch of coast, of the east coast of Australia where there was no road. Um, there was a very pioneering mentality still among the Shire to um, that the forest, the land is there to be conquered. Um, we take down the cedar and, and sell the timber and we build roads and then we develop property, put cows on it or, or cane or whatever you want. Um, but that was the mentality at the time. People had moved to the Daintree in the 1970s with a different outlook on life and land use. And they began to learn about some of the remarkable ecological um, traits of the Daintree rainforest uh, that I alluded to before. So the rare species, the endemic plants, uh, some plants um, were discovered there in the 1970s that had uh, that people had thought had been extinct for millions of years. So uh, botanists and ecologists began coming to the Daintree and realizing that this was a really special place that needed to be protected. A lot of um, local people who had moved to the area um, agreed with them, and they um, had moved there to set up a, a sustainable kind of alternative lifestyles. And they joined with the botanists and scientists to um, start the protest and stop the road from being built and stop development in um, the wider Daintree. Throughout the 1970s and 80s, um, real estate interests, um, an interest in the Daintree, there was cheap land available and uh, local um, real estate Developers um, took an interest in the land, international um, developers and investors took an interest in the land as well. So things were really, really heating up during the 80s um, or late 70s and into the 80s. This is a photo of the first day of the Daintree blockade. So there was about 40 or 50 people showed up. Um, one of the interesting things about the blockade is the man in the middle there with the beard is uh, Mike Berwick, who about 15 years, who was one of the key protesters, uh, key organisers of the protest. He um, 
became the spokesperson for the blockade on site, um, the go-to between the protesters and the police. And uh, but about to uh, listen, oh, maybe only six or seven years after the actual protest, he became mayor of the Douglas Shire. So he became mayor of the, the council he had once uh, he had once opposed. Um, the blockade itself uh, was a physical blockade. So people putting themselves on the line in front of bulldozers, in front of council workers to try and stop the machinery from going into the rainforest to build the road. These are a couple of the iconic photos uh, from the blockade. So on the left there, you have um, uh, Neville Tesh, who was the council foreman, a police officer um, um, taking his chainsaw away because he was about to fell, or he's threatening to, to fell a tree that a protester had climbed um, and had tied themselves to. On the right, you have uh, one of the most iconic images from the blockade of uh, one of the protesters on the cross um, or getting his friends to, to tie him to the cross in the manner of crucifixion um, with the sign, stop crucifying the rain for it. And a very powerful image. Um, the, the, um, when we might've been a more um, religious um, society. And uh, these are the images that went uh, around Australia and at times around the world. Um, that was the protest aimed to gain um, public and uh, media and political interest in the campaign to try and stop the protest. Um, another example of um, the protest, um, a couple of the protesters there in, or standing in front of the uh, bulldozer. And that was, a, that was a simple way to stop work on the forest, just to stand in front of the machine. Um, a dangerous thing to do at times, you can see the size of that blade, the, where the two uh, people are standing right there, the driver can't see them. So um, putting, you've had many protesters putting themselves um, in, arms, in harm's way to try, to try and stop. And stop the going ahead. There was enormous media interest in the campaign. Uh, the campaign itself came a year after the Franklin campaign, uh, the Franklin Dam campaign in Tasmania. So there was a growing uh, interest in environmental um, protests in the environment in general. The Hawke government had been elected in 1983 on the platform of. Um, Protecting Tasmania um, or protecting the, flank, the Franklin River from development and stopping the dam. So there was great hope amongst conservationists that they would do something similar um, in the Daintree. And the way to get that support was to get the photos um, of the guys on the cross and, and other images um, on the front page of newspapers, get public interest and get political interest, and political intervention. The state government that at the time was the very uh, pro-development, the Elke Peterson government, who backed um, Douglas Shire Council to build the road. Um, there's the human wall that that um, headline is talking about. Um, people digging themselves in um, holes to stop the road from being built and um, council back home being, in, um, being brought in to help dug them out, a dangerous manoeuvre there. So, um, this is um, some photos of where my research started. And so this is a really important um, collection for me. It, it is the Douglas Libraries Local History Collection. So I started working at Douglas Libraries about the year after we moved to North Queensland. I discovered the local history collection. I'd heard about the blockade and I um, realized that there was a big story here that hadn't been told. So I uh, spent my weekends coming into the library and sifting through the local history collection, newspaper articles, uh, ephemera, um, photocopies of anecdotes and other things um, in that collection that, um, that became my um, first Eureka moment. Um, so um, yeah, so that was a really important moment for me, realizing that hey, there was a big story here that hadn't been told. I began interviewing people local people who were, had been involved in the campaign. Um, there was a couple of small publications written at the time. And so I just looked them up 
um, in the phone book. I asked around and I spoke to Mike Berwick and a few of the other people who had been involved in the original 83, um, 84 campaigns and began to interview them. And slowly the momentum kind of um, for the book and the research developed. I got a couple of grants, um, RADF grants, small, smallish kind of grants, but that was enough to um, give me a little bit of confidence and, and um, a few little um, lines on my writing um, resume to help me um, get to the next stage of seriously considering um, writing the book. Um, my second Eureka moment um, after discovering the local uh, history collection at Douglas was a visit to James Cook University um, Library Special Collections. Um, archive. So that's housed in Cairns and that collection includes material from the Douglas Shire uh, Wilderness Action Group, the Cairns and Far North Environment Centre and the Wet Tropics Management Authority. Now I say a eureka moment because I, uh, I discovered a thesis that had been written at JCU that had been written for JCU um, and was housed at the Tans Townsville campus. I requested that the thesis be sent to um, Cairns so that I could look at it. Um, now Cairns is about an hour away from where I live, that campus. So I drove down to Cairns specifically to have a look at that thesis and discovered, and when I got there, um, the wrong thesis had been delivered from Townsville. I um, was a little bit discouraged because I've just driven an hour to, to drive um, to have a look at that particular document. Um, so I asked them to get the new document up, which would take a week or which would take a few days. I wouldn't be able to get um, to have a look at it for about a week or so. But while I was at the library, I, I had a little sticky beak around the, the uh, special collections um, area at, at James Cook University uh, Library and discovered um, the Douglas Shire Wilderness Action Group archive. Um, when I approached one of the librarians about what I'd found, um, she said, well, you shouldn't be sticking your nose around in there um, without permission. Um, and then followed that up with, well, what are you interested in that material for? And I explained what I, that I was researching the Daintree blockade. And she said, well, you'll be really interested in this. And she was just cataloguing about another 30 archive boxes from the um, Cairns and Far North Environment Centre and the Wet Tropics Management Authority. So that was a bit of a eureka moment. So I don't know if I hadn't have been there on that day, if the right thesis um, had have come along, I probably wouldn't have had a stick, known to have a sticky beak in the special collections area. And I since developed a great relationship with that librarian who, who um, was cataloging all of that material. When that came online, I could have a look at it. And that's, I realized that was definitely um, enough material for a book. Um, I also had a visit to my third Eureka moment was a visit to the National Library of Australia, um, which houses um, the Tiny Tui collection. Now, Tiny Tui was one of the protesters who left a couple of boxes of his archival material to um, the National um, Library of Australia. I went and visited that um, library and within that collection is a radio log of the, um, of the protests. So the protesters had set up a two-way radio system so that they could talk to different places um, within the protest, send, um, they had a relay station from Cape Tribulation out to a yacht, board off Low Islands and then back um, to Mossman. So um, in the Tiny Tui collection, there was a log of all this radio communication. We'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that the perspective of me being a writer was really um, important to me. And um, so I'll talk a little bit about that now. Um, so early on, I realized, or after I'd had my couple of Eureka moments, I kind of realized that it was a big story, that there was definitely a, at least one book in it. And, um, and so that really framed my uh, research. So I had been a writer for 10, years before I discovered this material, 10 or 15 years, never really had anything published, had a filing cabinet full of half-finished short stories and screenplays and all sorts of other material. When I, um, when I uh, found the different archives, um, I realised this was a, a big opportunity to tell a big untold story. So during my research, when I was going through newspapers, when I was interviewing people, I was always looking for certain 
things. And dialogue was one of the really important things. So, um, and that my books, newspaper articles, media interviews, radio, the radio log, which I discussed, um, and letters and handwritten notes. And this was really important, especially when you're for readers when they're right when they're reading a text. The dialogue helps to break up the the page, so it's easier to read. It reveals. Uh, character and personality traits different people have different ways of talking they use different words so really dialogue is a really important tool um, for a writer to be able to use for a historical writer to have access to dialogue was uh, brilliant i was always also looking for the openings and endings of chapters so what would draw people in at the beginning and leave them hanging um, or either laughing or crying at the end of a chapter now one example that I um, that I knew as soon as I, I heard it, um, I was interviewing a woman, um, an older a woman who had been at the Bloomfield end of the protest, which is the northern end where there was a very um, pro um, pioneering kind of spirit, um, rednecky um, kind of attitude, if you like. Um, wet Tropics Management Authority or the people organising the wet tropics. Um, once the blockade was over a couple of years later, the area was World Heritage listed. So the people that were organizing the World Heritage listing paid a visit to Bloomfield and held a meeting in, in one of the halls. The um, meeting was going along, there was a few people attending. All of a sudden the, the hall doors burst open and a couple of timber workers storm in with their hard hats on and all their, um, their work gear. And they're like, hey, you know, Bloody hell, this is terrible, you know. You blokes come up here from Brisbane and tell us what you think we can do with our land. This is just not on. Uh, the people giving the presentation who were from the Wet Tropics um, Listing Authority replied, um, sorry, um, sir, it's much worse than that. We're from Canberra. Um, with the fear or the joke being that, you know, somebody from Brisbane tell you what is bad enough, but for North Queensland, they're having somebody from Canberra, a bureaucrat from Canberra, telling them what they can or can't do, hundred times worse. So I was always looking for these little anecdotes that I could put at the beginning or end of. Um, also looking for material that reveals character. So letters telling the inner thoughts of one of the protesters. Um, go, don't tell. Um, revelations about somebody's um, personality. I'm a bit aware of how time is going. Um, so I can come back to a couple of points um, and use a couple of examples later if we have time. Um, and also looking for headlines um, along the way. So attention grabbing actions. So people almost being run over by a bulldozer or people spending nights um, living up trees, um, dialogue that a reader or interviewer or potential publisher um, go, wow, really looking for those our kind of factors um, all along the way. So, but it was really important um, for me as a the writer. That's how I approached the research. Um, and it might affect how other people, um, you know, I, get, I guess um, local historians might approach um, material in a slightly different way. Academics might approach the material in a different way as well. I will, um, I was always looking to be factual and, and not manipulate the information that I that I had gathered. But my goal from the outset was to tell a story and, a, and to create a manner of a book. Um, getting towards the end of my presentation now, and I will um, yeah just talk about a few of the local studies um, issues that um, I've reflected on, I guess, as um, when I was asked this presentation. Um, so the Do Douglas Library's collection um, of the Daintree Brigade material is um, very comprehensive. It's unbiased. It contains um, clippings from local newspapers um, and is um, supplemented by some articles from national newspapers and uh, magazines, the Bulletin or Women's Weekly, and other popular magazines of the time as well. So I didn't encounter any, any bias. Um, and this was at a time 
when the local council was pro road, they were the people building road and they were very pro development and they were ve vehemently opposed to the people organizing protests. They would come out um, in the media and uh, you know, the phone was very aggressive. The hippies and greenies and doll bludgers and pot smokers have come up to our shire. They've got no interest being here. They've got no interest in telling us what they should do. Um, so the local council run library um, or no bias in their collection, data, even not well, at a time when the council um, very, very strong on um, the road, whether or not it should be built. Um, but um, times change, and um, as one journalist who covered the protest pointed out to me, um, at the time of the protest, the Douglas Shire Council was actively anti greeny as I've just expressed. Um, but 35 years later or so, they gave um, two Australia Day awards to me for writing the very, um, very pro, pro blockade um, book about it. So it just shows you how much um, turnaround there has been um, in this area. The, um, the people who organised the protest um, and who fought for the World Heritage listing um, for what we now know as the wet tropics of Queensland. Um, they change the way people think about the environment. And um, I think a lot of local people, farmers and, um, and pioneers as well, have come to appreciate how special the area is and how um, important it is to retain what rainforest um, we have left. Um, bulk, oh, this is another, this is another point um, that I think the bulk of the material that I used was found at JC, it was found in those archives at the JCU. So probably all, all up 40 odd archive boxes I, I looked through with about 20 of those being um, specifically relating to the material on the book, on, on my book. So the important thing to note here was that this uh, material was collated and stored by the environment groups themselves and later donated to the university special. ACU Special Collections Library. So it wasn't the libraries or the local studies group that collated the vast majority of material that I've used, but rather the environment groups themselves who seem to have incredibly organised um, um, people on there um, who were in their committees um, as secretaries and, and a lot of the material was um, organised in folders by subject areas, by dates, or had been pasted into um, into scrapbooks. I'm often the old mouse scrapbook that I kind of remember using when I was in primary school. Um, yeah, that's um, I think a really important libraries in the local history um, groups that I got the vast majority of my uh, material from. It had been collected and collated um, really thoroughly um, by the environment groups. Um, finally, I, with particular relation to um, the local studies um, groups, I is working at, at Douglas Libraries, and this has happened over the, over the years, um, a group might come in with some boxes of archives from their society or their um, community group or whatever it is and say, oh, we'd like to donate this to the library. Now we, I um, will often think, um, well, where the hell are we going to put it? Um, and at times um, we will refer it somewhere else or we will not accept it um, because we don't have anywhere to house it ourselves. We're certainly happy to work with people um, in finding ways to um, keep material um, or to work with local History Society, um, which is very active in Douglas, to, um, to facilitate their storage of material. But it is certainly an issue as, as, um, as a small, well, a library in a small region, we don't have endless um, capacity for this sort of um, material. Uh, along with that, if the material does end up at a state library or a university library, I suspect that a lot of people might not know that it's there. Now, I'm fortunate that I 
that I work in libraries and have worked in libraries and worked in a university library prior to Douglas Library. So I am familiar with archives and catalogues, trove and, and um, a lot of the searching tools that librarians and archivists are familiar with. So, but members of the public um, or people starting out on this sort of journey or even writers uh, might not be as familiar as I am. So I do, um, I'm interested in, in the access, um, the ability of the public to access collections that are housed at university libraries and state libraries, and also awareness how, how we learn about, how the public learns about um, some of the collections that are housed at these uh, institutions. Um, developing a relationship with local history societies and other entities is really important, as I alluded to um, just now. Um, we have a really good group in Douglas, but they can have their own agendas or their own storage issues um, as well. But um, maintaining those networks and communication with those groups is um, really important as well, obviously. And probably the biggest um, issue for me, or, or one of the biggest things that I think about at the moment, changing face of the media um, locally and globally, source information. So. A lot of the material that I used in my book was from the Port Douglas and Mossman Gazette. It was one of the papers that was closed down in the um, News Corp's um, round of, of terminating lots of regional um, newspapers uh, last year. So there is no Port Douglas Mossman Gazette. There is no local paper serving the Douglas community. Fans Post as well. Uh, is still a daily uh, paper with um, a larger Saturday um, offering, but journalism and post is um, nothing compared to what it was. There was really good investigative journalism and really good feature writing um, back in the 80s when the blockade happened, but it's very rare to see that um, these days and so much information now is online. Um, the local history collection at Douglas um, has very little material added to, it, added to it these days because there is no print material coming out. The resource that uh, I used and that was invaluable for me in writing my book um, just uh, won't be there for somebody who might be writing um, a book about um, events that happen in this century. So there will be a lot of information digitally, but available digitally, but then um, in the back and, um, and a whole range of other issues of finding um, information that would have been valuable um, and um, referenced and checked. So yeah, those are some of my um, issues. I'm happy to discuss them further. Um, and that's I think the end for me for the time being. Bill, thank you very much. That was fabulous. I really enjoyed it now. I really want to read that book. Okay. <laughs> I also like the way that you highlighted the, the technology changes. You used newspaper clippings. And so to be able to do research from things now, it's looking at the different formats for collecting. That's right. um, and it struck me that oral histories and photographs may be what's necessary because, you know, maybe environmental protests these days use WhatsApp groups to organise. And so you're not going to be able to access those in the way that you were those radio logs. No, that's right. Um, I, I was interviewing or somebody interviewed me for, for her book that came out recently. Uh, she'd interviewed me a few a few years ago while she was still doing the research and she said what can I you know what should I be doing she was talking about the Adani protests and and so she's written a, a book that has some of that material in it and she said what should I be doing and I I just said oh you know you've got to get uh, you've got to get microphones to people on the front line um, that's that's where you you know that's going to be the most interesting um, and most telling um, stories me anyway what's happening on the front line you know i'm really interested in the people that are that are there in, in the trenches um so to speak uh, you know the political landscape often i don't know and i like politics as well but you know um, 
yeah, you're right. Where will that information be stored? Because it probably won't come to a library. It will be retained um, you know, within a, a WhatsApp application or, or perhaps, um, you know, some of those digital formats uh, might become redundant and, 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 you know, what's after WhatsApp, there's something else. And, and maybe some of that information might come across. So you know, I think it really is important to try to find ways to capture those. Yes. Um, yeah. That's why I was wondering about things like photographs and oral histories, because with photographs, say, I'm thinking of the knitting nanas in the Gloucester area in New South Wales, and that is their name. Yep. Deliberately, yeah. They did a lot of knitting and they were slightly older women, um, but they claimed that, and that, but they were super active in their protests uh, in the Gloucester area. But they would be trackable through the Facebook group. So for them, it would be about, I think, talking with them individually and asking for copies mm. of photographs on their phones using correct donation forms and those kinds of things, but also highlighting that um, it might be broader things. And I know in New South Wales, we have collected some material from the Knitting Nanners um, at a state level because mm. of a state significance, but it's also something that could be collected locally but also at the national level. So I think your point about people really being aware of um, where else local material may be collected, it could be a local university, but as you say, it could be the national um, library or a university in Canberra. So yeah, helping people find out about those would be helpful. Um, any questions from other people or are you so, filled with thoughtfulness that you're struggling to think of what to ask about. There's a bit going on in chat about collection size and what you accept. Yeah. And that certainly is a point, um, but I do think there's also a factor around format changes um, yeah. and considering how those are managed as well. Um, too. You know, some of the time is another thing as well. And I think, um, you know, this sort of research takes so long and I know the cataloguing of, of it takes a long time as well. The, at JCU, you know, I was just really lucky that I had a couple of people that were really, um, that were quite committed to making sure that this material wasn't just safely housed, but that I, the other that people such as me, researchers, could search the library catalogue and have a pretty good idea of what was going to be there. So that was you know, really important for me. It wasn't just that there was a collection there, it's that this box has this, and, and these are the types of things that you might find in it, yeah. Yes, yeah, so yet another shout out to the importance of cataloguing your resources in a way that's findable. I also yeah. have a point about unbiased collecting, and it made me think about the Linen Library in Northern Ireland. They managed to collect from both sides of the Troubles during, <laughs> um, when people in Northern Ireland were trying to kill each other, depending yeah. on various factors. But the Linen Library was scrupulous in collecting from quite hardcore terrorist groups. Yeah, sure. But they collected from, from everyone. So they couldn't be accused of bias. And the, um, an article I read said the library staff felt really safe because they knew they were collecting without bias and they had to feel safe because they're asking some fairly scary people and fairly scary organisations, can we have a copy of your flyer, please? Yeah. Um, so I, I did like your, um, your point about not being biased. And actually, if a library isn't collecting some material about local disharmony, then maybe that is showing bias by saying that everything was peachy in the area when there were Adani protests, there were Daintree protests, there were fracking protests that aren't being shown through the collection. I don't know. Oh, absolutely. You know, bias by exclusion, um, definitely. And it would be really interesting, I think, to look at some of those um, more conservative um, towns along the <laughs> Queensland coast, see what sort of material they are collecting. And again, as I said, um, you know, a lot of it comes back to the actual groups themselves. Um, and I do wonder these days whether the groups have the sort of um, mentality for retaining the information that 
um, that the groups that I studied did. You know, the, the record keeping was just phenomenal. Minutes, books, um, articles cut out and catalogued um, before they were put into folders or, or scrapbooks. So, um, yeah, but I think they, that you know, they, the people that were organising the protest were 30 or, or, or 40 at the time of the blockade. They might have already been on a, on a school PNC committee or they might have already been doing um, those sorts of things for a local club or a different sort of organisation. So they brought with them that range of skills, um, whereas um, even people my age and younger um, you know, might not even know what a, you know that there is a PNC committee or that there is, you know, people doing these sorts of roles. Um, yeah. So maybe some of it's about getting the message out about the range of things, even if it's not committing that you'll collect everything that every community group is doing, but that it's about being an awareness around good record keeping in yeah. a range of formats so that potentially a library or archive may collect. Yeah. Even if it's their own um, organisations, one having a better structure. Yeah. The, yeah, look, I think having difficult issues, um, collecting around difficult issues, I think is really important. And there are a few ongoing issues in um, in the Douglas Shire that I think it's really important to be able to talk about. But there is, you know, when you bring some of these things up, there are local hostilities. Um, I, well, before COVID, I was selling my book at, um, at local markets. And it wasn't unusual for me to have a, to have somebody, you know, have a gentle um, word of um, a, well, abuse, I guess, all of the times about what I'd done and, and that, you know, there should be more bloody roads and, and all of that. So, um, but it is something that needs to be done and, and especially for a writer, you know, it's, you're, you're looking, I'm looking for drama. Yeah. And that's certainly, yes. And, and yes quite a few of the environmental protests um, did have drama. Um, and thankfully they did because we've got the Daintree. That's right. Oh, absolutely. You know, they they did a remarkable thing in achieving World Heritage listing. So a full marks to them and, and obviously of um, the book kind of comes down on the side of the, the protesters. But a lot of people say that it's really well balanced as well. People that I haven't met are surprised at how well both viewpoints are old. Um, yeah. Is it too soon to ask what's the next book? Oh, um, no, it's not too soon to ask. So I'm writing a book about another um, big um, story from the Bielke Peterson era. There, uh, in 1976, there was a police raid on a hippie community uh, north of the Daintree, and that became a big political scandal. So it's a little bit like the, the Daintree, um, my Daintree book, in that there's this big kind of story that became newsworthy and was was in the news both statewide and nationally for about a year um but that hasn't really been explored fully so that's my next project and a, and a few of the people that were at um at the name tree were also at cedar bay so there's some parallels um with the story but also it's a, a lot of um, policing and legal issues that i'll need to look in there as well rather, rather than the environmental and issue but another yeah another topic that i'm really interested in big north queensland history well i think that'll be an exciting one for all of us to look forward to reading once we've read the Dane Tree. Yeah. okay yeah yeah um i'm have i missed any questions liz that have been coming through there's been a bit of chat about the importance of the collecting and how great your talk is but i think everyone's a little bit still thinking things through and not quite and really going we need to take action so Thank you so much, Bill, for um, your presentation today. It was- Oh, thank you. I'm really looking forward thank to Thank you. And it's certainly got a lot of everyone here thinking about their um, local studies collections- yeah, and great. To um, encompass um, protests and other local right. actions. So thank you right. so much. You're welcome. So pe people can buy the book from that website there, it's not online. And there's free postage at the moment. Plug, plug. Oh, please do. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks, Ellen.
Okay, well, we're going to now move south quite a long way to Victoria. I'm just going to unshare Bill's screen and Farley is here. So I'm just going to un. Uh, I'm here. Terrific. I'll just give you a brief introduction and then I will um, hand over to you if that's okay. Yeah, that works. Okay. It's really exciting that we have um, Dr. Farley Connolly with us today. He's a wildlife ecologist with EnviroDNA and his work focuses on the use of environmental DNA or eDNA to detect the presence of species from samples in the environment, including the much um, threatened platypus. In his talk, he will explain what eDNA is, discuss some projects he's been conducting with it, and how citizen science can take part in this in these studies. Over to you, Farley. All right, let me just start this. Then let me share the screen, which I'm not doing. Okay, how are we looking? Looks great. I can see a platypus. You guys see a platypus? You see this, if you see the full screen, you guys see the smaller screen. I can see this, the full screen and the smaller screen. You might need to use something like, I think the term is something like mirror display, so you don't get the, the next slide showing as well. Yeah, I'm failing right now. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, no. Look, I just feel Zoom keeps changing. And so, um, yeah. I only learned it because I was showing my second screen at one stage too. So it's it's something like mirror screen. Got it. Actually, I think I figured this out. And then still doing the same thing, isn't it? Uh, no, it's that? not full screen yet. Uh, what the heck? I'm just seeing. I'm just seeing a platypus. Here we go. How is this? Beautiful. All right, cool. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Now I'm, now I'm seeing the next slide. Whatever you did just before then, showing one slide only. Yeah, you should be seeing now just the one slide, right? The platypus? No, I'm seeing the trailing slide as well, which is the little graph. What? Guys, I'm really, I apologize. It's good on my screen. We're all good to it's go? It's good. We're good to all go. All right, cool. Bill, congratulations on being much better at organizing yourself than I am. Um, again, my name is uh, Dr. Barry Connolly. I work for a group called EnviroDNA. Um, and I am, yeah, a wildlife ecologist. I've been a wildlife ecologist for about a decade now, which is crazy to think about. Um, and I actually just finished up my PhD last year, um, looking at something entirely different, which was urban ecology is focusing on magpies and how um, urban pollutants actually affect magpies. So if you have any magpie questions after this, feel free to send my way. I'm always happy to chat about everybody's favorite or least favorite bird, the magpie. So what is eDNA um, and why do we want, why am I talking about it? Well, in wildlife ecology, studying animals, we have a whole array of different techniques to do it. Um, we have some traditional things like trapping or visual monitoring. We have things like audio recording, which is something I use actually a lot for birds. And then we have this new technique, which is called environmental DNA. Now, environmental DNA is pretty simple, actually. Um, it is the idea of detecting DNA um, that is shed into the environment. Now, all of us as animals and all the animals in the wild all shed and leave DNA pretty much wherever we go. Um, this is in the form of skin samples or hair samples, or say if you have to go to the bathroom, you're leaving DNA pretty much everywhere. And the beautiful thing about using this to detect species is it's extremely non-invasive. Um, it has really simple uh, sampling methodologies. Um, it gives us both a quick Snapchat of what, what is there currently, but also what potentially was there a little bit ago. Um, and this is always a question that comes up, how long does DNA stay in the environment? It's very depending. It depends on kind of the conditions of the environment, how much sunshine, the temperature, everything. But if it's preserved correctly, it could be tens of thousands of years. If it's not preserved correctly, it could be a matter of days or minutes. So it's really just dependent on what you're kind of looking at. Um, in addition to this, it's also extremely sensitive and it's extremely cost-effective. 
So the beginning of eDNA kind of started in 2008, at least that's when the first published paper came out. Um, and as you can see, since that publication, it has just absolutely taken over as far as how we use for, uh, well, how we use this for bio, uh, biodiversity. And so, yeah, for the first publication in the last nine years, we're talking about zero papers to over 400 papers. And that number is still growing. Now, how do we detect it? So in the field, what we're looking for and how we actually go about looking for DNA is we can use pretty much anything to detect it. We're talking about water, soil, scat samples. We can detect it off of surfaces. Um, we actually can detect it out of mosquitoes. And so if you have say blood sucking critters like mosquitoes um, are well, obtaining DNA from their host and you actually can take that mosquito, process it and actually detect what creature they were sucking on prior to. You also get it from plants. Um, and then once you actually get this, then it's all pretty much a lab process. The most common way in which we actually do eDNA work is through water. And water is this amazing aggregate where things all need water, either for drinking or just to live in. And so it's really simple for us to go to our local creek system, take a filter, withdraw some water, push it through the filter, and there we have an eDNA sample. And this is something we've used extensively across um, Melbourne and across Australia. It's something that we've gotten quite efficient at even working with citizen scientists. And so from a sample of water like this, we're able to do quite a lot of stuff, but of course we have to go into the lab. Um, and in the lab, what we are doing is we are taking that filter, we are extracting the DNA, and then we are processing it in order to look for specific species or for groups of species. So there are two different species detection methods. The first is target species, and the second is a biodiversity assessment looking at multi-species. Now, currently, um, well, right now, I'll quickly go through what target species is. So target species is um, pretty much you're looking at, you're taking a sample, you're looking at, you create a primer that looks for a single series of DNA, and it's trying to match it to a specific species. Currently, we have all of these different species here listed, um, as well as many more species, and we're able to create these for pretty much any species out there. We are able to create a primer for that you then can detect using DNA. The platypus has been really a, pretty important species to us. Um, our company once was uh, together with our sister company called Caesar, and we've been doing platypus work for the past 20 years and have had not only um, eDNA work, but also live capture surveys. And so for a live capture survey for platypus, this is kind of the thing you're looking at. It's, um, I've done this quite extensively. You set up these nets and waterways. Um, it takes quite a long time to set them up, say half hour to 45 minutes per two nets. You set them up in eight or nine different locations and you have to actually sample throughout the middle of the night. So if you can imagine, it's quite exhausting, tiresome, um, but you do get some great results. And here's a picture of my colleague actually holding a platypus. Um, but the amazing thing about what eDNA has allowed is while we, I do love going out and collecting platypus and getting these incredible images like this, through eDNA, we are actually able to start comparing um, the differences between platypus um, catching, catching them in the wild and then catching them uh, using eDNA. And if you can see this graph, I don't like to show many figures, but I'm gonna force you guys to look at one. What this graph is saying that in order to say that you've positive, you've collected every single platypus within a single waterway, you have to go out on 10 different survey nights. And for someone like me, that means you're staying up all night, you're sampling every single night, It's 14 hour days, massive, massive amount of time. But with eDNA um, and using a very simple uh, strategy of collecting water and pressing through a filter, we're talking you need to do two or three samples and you're able to get the exact same confidence. And so eDNA is just this amazing tool for using to detect species like platypus because it gives you that same uh, opportunity to get that 95% 95, 95 chance of detecting a platypus but only having to use two eDNA water samples that could be collected in five, 10 minutes versus six to 10 nights of surveys. So that is target species. And we've gotten quite good at it, extremely high efficiency, we're talking 95%. Now the other approach that eDNA allows is this thing called biodiversity assessments and something we use, which is meta barcoding. Now the sample methods are the exact same. You go out, have a filter, you collect some water, spray it through the filter, bring the filter to the lab, and then you send it to our lab uh, technicians who are able to process it. But instead of looking at a single species in the sample, we are able to look at groups of species. 
And so what you do is you have the DNA in that sample and within that sample, you could have, you know, frogs, you could have reptiles, you can have mammals, you can have all these sort of different things. And we use, instead of using a single marker for a single species, we're actually using a marker that detects say all vertebrates or all fish. And so that'll be a segment of DNA that all of those species will have. And then for, we are able to mark that, we're able to stick it through a robot. The robot then tells apart the different samples. So it separates, okay, this cDNA belongs to this, this cDNA belongs to this, and they separate it. And then what we are able to do using bioinformatics is we are able to tell which DNA strand equates to which animal. And so for this, what I'm showing you is a fish uh, metabarcoding. So you have all this DNA, it labels each one. And then what you do later is you're actually able to pick apart which one is which. And so within that one sample where say we were just detecting DNA, uh, just detecting platypus, we are now actually able to look at, okay, what other species are there? And all of a sudden you can get a breakdown of, okay, instead of being again, one species, we have four different species. There's this much DNA of this one, this much of this one. You're actually able to get a kind of a comparison of saying, here's how much of those species are within the system. And what's really cool about this, and kind of want to show these comparison models is just like I showed with the uh, comparison of the fike nets and catching platypus manually or using eDNA, we also have done a lot of studies of this, looking at how this biodiversity testing method of water samples and metabarcoding versus something traditional like a camera trap. Now camera traps are used quite extensively, especially for terrestrial animals. And so this group um, wanted to look at, okay, how good is eDNA detecting things in terrestrial species? Because eDNA does not just have to be water, it also can be terrestrial. And so what this Venn diagram is showing you is that through these two methods, there is a lot of um, overlap, but eDNA actually is quite uh, good and actually did perform better at detecting these smaller species that camera traps just would never detect. So it gives you that just finer layer of uh, detail, that little bit more accuracy than you would not get with traditional and other methods. So whole reason we're talking about this is that um, this method is fantastic with citizen scientists. I know that's what you guys are most interested in. And so we actually have done quite a bit of work with citizen scientists and it honestly is a fantastic tool for us as biologists to use citizen scientists or free labor a lot of times and actually get some really cool results because I'm only one scientist. I only have so many days to go out, but when you actually can utilize citizen scientists, the results can be just fantastic. And so what's great about eDNA and the kits that we use is all we have to do is pack up a kit in these little bags like this, as you can see, just very simple come a little lunch case, and we're actually able to send these off to citizen scientists. Now these can be sent to, and have been sent previously to say a library where people can come pick up the packs, go take the samples, bring them back to the packs, then send them back to us. Or we've even done programs where we actually send them door to door. So instead of people having to you know, work around, we're actually able to send these to remote areas, they can get them sent, picked up, they get dropped off their house, go take the sample the next day or so, and then have them sent back to us. It provides a really easy and fun way for citizen scientists to get involved. Oops, sorry. And here's all you need. And this, I think, the most important uh, press apart. It's really only four things. We're talking about a syringe, a couple of filters, which are these little tiny 0.22 um, nanome, uh, uh, micron filters that are, if you want to compare it to something, if you know what a life straw is, what we actually drink to get clean water out of, um, a pair of a couple of filters, some gloves, and a nice block. And that's all you need to conduct a citizen science project with eDNA um, samples. And we love this because more than anything, there is a growing detachment of people from their local waterways or the local environment. And so we find this is such a great resource to use in order to get people out there sampling directly. So participating in science project, getting out there into their local environment. Um, and then also the data they're getting is not just a one-off. These data can be used and actually really provide some important biodiversity data that can be used by Melm Water or by us or by other groups if they want to use it. Um, and also is able to demonstrate, um, which we're finding more and more, is just how biodiverse urban waterways are and how important they really serve as hotbeds for um, wildlife in areas that say they may struggle in. Um, little ponds or these refuge areas within cities actually provide some really important habitat for urban wildlife. So, I will go with you through a project we conducted last year, um, end of last year. Um, it was just out of lockdown and we really wanted to, we were working on water and we really wanted to get some citizen scientists involved. And so 
what we did was we created a vertebrate biodiversity survey. So using our meta barcoding technique, we looked at anything with a backbone and that's what our, we're trying to do. And so we were sending out citizen scientists across Melbourne water. And these are all the locations that actually people suggested. So in total about 250 locations where citizen scientists were able to get online, propose the area they wanted to sample in, and then we were gonna go and sample. So due to budget constraints, we had to lower this down to about 70 sites but still pretty fantastic. So 70 sites in total, all citizen scientists, um, and this is across five different catchments and incorporated a number of different waterway types and habitats. We're talking urban ponds to the beautiful flowing river through the forest. And the amazing thing is from this study that was conducted by citizen scientists and just using these 70 sites, so about 140 samples in total, we are able to detect 26 fish species, five different frog species, 40 bird species, 29 mammal species, and five reptile species. Now, as a person who's worked in biology for a long time, uh, to get these kind of results off of what may have been 30 minutes to an hour per citizen scientist is pretty amazing. Because if I were to go out and try to get this many, I know I can get the birds, I'm quite a good birder, but to get something like 29 mammals, five reptiles, 26 fish, five frog, in such a small amount of time, we're talking about this all occurred in about two weeks, is absolutely phenomenal. And so we are able to kind of lay it off in this really fun, um, I think really fun map. So the larger the circle, the more diverse the area. And what I thought was really telling um, is just how diverse um, our urban areas are. So if you can look, you have these areas, especially around Melbourne, around Frankston, um, around Werribee, where you have these very large circles. And that is actually because the number of species at those places located very close to city centers actually were quite diverse. And what's funny is that what you kind of expect when you think about, you know, beautiful areas should have really beautiful or the most biodiversity. In fact, when you look at areas in the Dananongs or in the Yarra Valley, it's like, oh, actually, you know, you don't get quite as much diversity. And I thought that was really fascinating and something as an urban ecologist I really love. And this again is just showing more just how diverse these kind of areas were. So in summary, um, I hope you kind of have a bit of an understanding now of how powerful DNA, eDNA can be as a technique to detect biodiversity. This is both at looking at DNA at target species, um, looking at individual species like the platypus and just getting that really good efficiency and able to detect these things which are extremely elusive, extremely hard to find or by looking at a more biodiversity standpoint and trying to look at, okay, what, what is here? And I wanna know everything that's here. Um, now these projects can be, again, if you are looking to kind of do a project like this or running this to one of your libraries, you can do it um, both with aquatic and terrestrial species. So um, we have options now available where if you wanna just do water samples, we can easily do that. But also there are options for, if you have an interest in actually doing terrestrial environments as well, collecting soil samples or doing tree swabs and all these different techniques. We can talk further about that if you have an interest in doing work in the terrestrial environment in addition to the aquatic environment. Um, and it also gives you, I hope I've shown and demonstrated just how much these, this kind of research um, using citizen scientists can help. Um, scientists, budgets are not big. Um, we don't have that much time in the day. And so to actually use citizen scientists who may know the area better, who want to spend some time getting to know their local environment um, and want to be part of something that's bigger um, I think it's extremely important. I think eDNA offers a very easy and fun way to access this. Um, so yeah, so I just wanna say uh, thank you to all of you for listening. Um, if you are interested in more, uh, to learn more about um, EnviroDNA uh, Enviro company, but also just about eDNA in general, um, we have a white paper available on our website. Um, this gives you even more detail than um, kind of what I went through and also provides you with some information of um, uh, how you can go about starting your own eDNA project. Um, but you also can, of course, uh, contact me um, if you're interested in running your own eDNA project. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was fabulous. Now we've got one question looking at, is there EDA, eDNA work happening in other states or territories? Because we do have people from New South Wales and Queensland participating as well. So 
Are there options for those states to work with your company or similar projects? Yeah, so we actually run, I believe we have a project currently going in every single state, except for maybe Western Australia at the moment. And we've worked in pretty much every state. We've worked internationally. And we've worked um, pretty much everywhere we can work. And whoever wants to work with us, we're willing to work with them. And the Citizen Science Project, obviously, since we are Melbourne-based um, and we have a really good client with Melbourne Water, and they are really keen on trying to get um, citizen science active. It's been very focused, but again, we are willing to work with anybody. <laughs> so if libraries worked with you, say, and if we use the Melbourne Water example as um, one of them, would say if a library mobilised citizen science in their area, would they be able to get a copy of the data for their local studies collection? Yeah, so what we actually do, and, um, and we're trying to be better about it as well, but when we usually when we do these citizen science projects, we like to go, um, obviously, send say that your library the kit, you guys go out, and then we process all the information, and then we'd host a webinar like this to detail kind of what we found, maybe some significant sites, um, and then, yeah, you have full access to whatever data you want from us. Um, and then we also have, and some of our information, too, is available online at the moment, so if you were interested, say, in a specific area, you can always message me and be like, oh, I'm just curious. We wanted to think here, what species could we potentially be detecting? We also can let you know that way too. But from what you're saying, it could also be a good collaborative project because for instance, say the waterways of Melbourne cut across a lot of local government areas and so a lot of library services. So it could be, there could be instances where it's good to talk with the neighbors as well to kind of go, well, actually we could coordinate this on a larger scale. Does that? Yeah. Oh, I think if you, if you wanted to do, and then we're, we're dealing with these more and more as you have these groups like say Landcare Australia is when we deal with. You do have these groups say like, or like the library where they have this massive resource of humans that want to get involved and want to do something and the infrastructure is already there. And so it's really just sending out kits and you guys can kind of take care of it. So if you want to do some kind of collaboration like that, we are more than happy to work with you in doing so. So it's really about, it sounds like pitching the project almost. Yeah. It's pretty much the speech of the project. It's really just getting interest. It's getting interest in, and I think citizen scientists are interested. It's the idea of, well, it's getting funding, but it's also getting, yeah, just getting funding and getting interest from these larger bodies to run a study like this. Because again, it's in, when you compare it to other methods, it's actually quite inexpensive. Like it's because me going out there as the expert and trying to show you as many birds as possible, I could do it for a day and it's going to cost you a lot versus this is people getting to go out with some very little instruction and they can conduct a really, really amazing um, experiment and they can do it themselves and the data they get is viable really good data. There's a question that's um, um, come through just are you interested is it water, urban waterways or could it be more remote areas so for instance people going on day bushwalks? Yeah either or I mean it's the big thing about eDNA and um, what I really enjoy kind of talking to people is it's you, the project you're trying to create is really up to you so it's kind of what do you want to look at so Say if we're doing a project with libraries, it would be, you know, you can do two ways. One, we're trying to maximize, okay, we want to get as much, as much cover as possible. So we're going to try to aim to get as many waterways as possible. We're going to really strategically put it this way. Or is it, you know, if it's a local, one local library that was really just curious about their own stuff and particular areas, then you can just sample those particular areas. So it's really kind of what you want, or if it's certain species you're trying to target. So if you want platypus, okay, let's look at Look at the publicly available on um, Atlas of Living Australia, where have platypus been seen historically? We wanna target platypus. We're gonna do our little surveys all around these areas where platypus potentially could be. And we're gonna see if platypus are there in addition to potentially getting what other species are there too. So these, it's really, it's, and again, what's fun about this is it allows, if so, say libraries wanted to run a program, it allows you guys to think of the questions um, and then we could help you guys figure out the methods to answer those questions. I was thinking it could be helpful for some of the, say, um, environmental reporting that councils do mm -hmm. um, as a way of looking at that. How much are the kits? Just to kind of get a ballpark, although I realise the cost isn't yet known in the kit, it's in the kit plus, but just to get an idea. Yeah, so the kits themselves are, I mean, the kits are the cheapest, right? So the, kits, the kits are just twelve fifty a piece. Um, but the, where it gets more expensive is the idea of actually running a program. And so say... Yeah. If you want to do a meta barcoding program, it's going to cost somewhere between $200 and $300 per sample. So that's where wow. you have to really get a cost. And the larger the project, the cheaper each sample gets. Um, so we can do it on scale. If we're doing two to 300 people are going out and collecting, it's much cheaper than just doing, say, 50. Right, right. Okay. 
That sounds, um, yeah, that I was just thinking because someone's mentioned maybe seeing if they could get local funding and I was just wondering kind of what the ballpark looks like as a starting point. Um, and, and, and actually, interesting enough, we actually are trying to, because we, we work with a lot of um, corporate organizations. And so mm -hmm. for them, the cost isn't as much, but what we really want is more of this on the ground, get citizen scientists, get people active, really promote biodiversity, not just, not just near sites where people are interested in say, no council issue. We actually want to know, okay, what interesting areas are that people want to know about? And how do we go to areas that say Melbourne Water doesn't care about anymore? We want to go somewhere a little further away. And so we are trying to organize now where we um, usually have these minimum numbers you have to hit. And so we're actually now doing these probably quarterly different runs where people who only want to do, say, nine samples, instead of doing the classic 50, can just send nine samples in. It's a little under $200 per sample. Then you do a fairly cheap biodiversity survey in just a small little local area. And we trialed it just recently and it worked extremely well. We had some, a couple of different citizen scientists actually got a group of them together and actually sent us samples in uh, using that system. Okay, that sounds like it could be an option for, yeah. And, and particularly when libraries can get a set of the data to include in their local studies collection for, this is what the biodiversity is like at this stage. There was a question, did you do any work in the Mary Valley in Queensland to assess the evidence of the lungfish? Uh, funny enough, I'm doing a, we're actually, we've only never, we've never done a lungfish project before. We are currently conducting a lungfish project. Um, I can't actually technically tell because it's a confidential thing with our client, yep. or it, but we are, we will have a lungfish probe soon, which is pretty great. Yes, and um, one of the comments also was this could be a great way to get schools involved as well, because you have a lot of little feet that can go around or not so little feet, depending on <laughs> yeah, and science. I, and we're working to try to get into schools as well. So we've, um, we've uh, applied for a bunch of different grants with about, I think it's five or six different schools. Um, I think one's actually in New South Wales, but the rest are just in Victoria. And we're trying to get a school program because, yeah, I think it's I mean, getting kids down by the water to take some samples just sounds like a, a no brainer. They'd absolutely enjoy it. As long as, yes, but there's probably risk assessments that the schools have to fill in <laughs> to make sure that, you know, no one's going to drown, et cetera. That's true. That's very true. And that we do press that. That's again, it's one of those funny things with this, uh, with eDNA, is people are often ask us, like, well, how, like, should we go to the steep bank? Should we go to this little uncharted area? It's like, no, no. Just go to an area that's easy to access because DNA is so great because you're going to get what's up from the water. Like anything flowing towards you is also going to come your way. So you're going to get things that are a few kilometers apart. So even if there's a platypus a kilometer away, there's a good chance you're going to get some of that DNA where you are a kilometer downstream. Right. Um, and another question, are there online resources you'd recommend for people to find out about the species in their local areas? Yeah. So, um, the best one is ALA, so the Atlas of Living Australia. Um, it's free to sign up for it, and it's a really good resource. It's one that we actually use, um, and it just provides you with, um, so it gives you a combination of actual evidence. So say there's scat collected or skin samples collected from that are museums and everything, but also pe people cited something reported, it tells you that. Uh, another good one is iNaturalist is fantastic. Um, and that also allows you to put in your findings. Um, and then the final one, which I am a, I'm a, I'm a serious bird watcher. And I will say, if you've not, if you like birds and you're not on eBird, get on eBird because eBird is one of the most phenomenal resources for finding out what birds are near you and the way in which they go about it. They tell you where the hotspots are, they color it, the maps they show you are phenomenal. And it's such a great resource to see what, what the bird biodiversity in your area is. Thank you. So they're, they're all good resources that, that the local study staff can use for um, environmental um, uh, data about their areas. Um, Completely. And if you're really curious too, feel free to send me a message. If you really, if you need some help or something like that, I'm more than happy to, you know, you need like quick, a quick tutorial on how to run through like ALA, just find out what's here. I can always help out with that stuff. Thank you. Well, um, you might get followed up. Another question as <laughs> to the data that you collect. All right. What happens to the data that you collect? Um, it just depends. Um, it depends who the client is. So if the client wants it, they can keep it. They get the, obviously they're paying for it, so they get it. Melbourne Water, um, as one of our biggest clients, they try to share it as much as possible. So that is also available pretty much publicly. Um, so it really just depends. Um, and uh, it's really up to the people 
collecting it, what they want to have to do with it. Okay, um, sounds that sounds good. Um, but the data, the data is whoever collects it. That's it's their data. Like we share it, okay. obviously, but it's the person who collects it's their data. So with say, um, just I'm getting clarification through chat that it's also what with say the water samples that come through or the, um, the filters samples. What do you keep those? Yeah. So what happens is so pretty much those you'll get. To, so say if we send you a pack. Uh, in the pack with two filters, you go and you take the syringe filled with water, press it through the filter, try to get afterwards as much water out, of, try to get as much water through it, and then uh, you toss in your fridge, try to get it back to us within about 24 to 48 hours. And the beautiful thing of those filters is, I wish I had one on me, but they pretty much have, we actually use them to process the DNA and extract it. So that filter actually is, the DNA extractor is put into an agent that's put inside that filter, it actually then is used to actually extract the DNA and the DNA is pulled from it. And then the filter itself, I mean, it's at that point, it's useless because the container's damaged. So that actually the filter itself will be used in the process of SAM, uh, analyzing the DNA. But it's kind of used and then destroyed through the process of being used. Exactly. Right. And then hopefully recycled in a meaningful way. <laughs> I, I, that's the only, we're really trying hard. Our kits now are fully biodegradable or used recycled products. We send out these mailers, we send out our biodegradable, the lunch packs are obviously reusable. We try to reuse as many boxes as we possibly can. But unfortunately, when it comes to DNA, it has to be sterile. And so if you have any contamination, you're just gonna, you're gonna ruin your sample. And we're talking about if you had a filter open in your house and your dog licked it, that could ruin your sample because we're gonna find a lot of dog DNA and that's gonna mask a lot of everything else. <laughs> Okay, well, that's good to know. I think that's all the questions. Um, please join with me in thanking Farley. That was fabulous. Thank you. Thanks so much. Now we're going to move over to discussion. And I'm if people need to be unmuted, um, we'll, we can do this through chat, but also really happy to do it through voice. So if I need to unmute, you send me a message through chat so that if I haven't already unmuted you and you can't unmute yourself and make your video um, visible, um, please let me know. So now um, we're going to start a bit of a discussion and we're going to start with, and I'm going to put this in, in chat as well, what kind of environmental information you collect about your area? And please use chat or voice, um, but do let me know. Yeah. And I'm sure both Farley and Bill will be getting more questions coming along after this um, with some very, uh, with some specifics. Now I might stop the recording at this stage for the discussion. Is there any reason people can think of why I shouldn't do that? <laughs> 